President for Asia and Japan Chair here at CSIS. As many of you know, uh, he served in the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, as a senior director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. Um, sitting next to him is uh, the famous Chogap Jae, uh, longtime uh, senior journalist at Choson Ilbo and, uh, and a longtime observer of Korean politics, Korean political issues, as well as the North Korea issue. Uh, sitting next to him is our good friend Kim Tae Hyo. Kim Tae Hyo uh, served in a couple of positions in government, but his last position was as a senior secretary or national security advisor to President Lee Myung Bak. Um, in the Blue House. Uh, and in Washington, we have this phrase, who is the go-to person in a particular country when it comes to policy issues? At least that's the way Professor Green and I used to talk about it when we were on the NSC. Um, and Kim Tae-hyo was the go-to guy uh, when it came to the Republic of Korea. And then uh, uh, poor John Sifton, he arrived here this morning and didn't realize that he'd be serving on two panels and has done a fantastic job um, in doing that. John Sifton is the Asia Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch uh, and has been uh, one of the important forces behind uh, the movement uh, in New York and around the world when it comes to North Korean uh, human rights. So like the other panels, we are, st we are doing this as a conversation. And I'd like to start uh, by asking my colleague, Mike Green, um, <clears throat> uh, if you could say a little bit about Again, this idea of the policy context of North Korean human rights. I mean, you served in the White House for six years, I think, uh, in, the Bush, in the first and the second Bush administration. Um, how, in your own mind, how do you see the human rights issue? How was it back then? How has it been now? In what ways is it different? And what do you see as the policy challenges, particularly when we look at the other priority for the United States, which is the North Korean nuclear issue? Thank you, Victor. Um, well, first of all, this conference itself, um, I think, will be viewed as um, experts on this issue and historians as a real turning point. <clears throat> because I don't think, quite aside from the snow, I don't think you would have had such a high-level um, uh, gathering around this issue five or 10 years ago, frankly. Um, and um, I also think the Commission of Inquiry report represents, for the international community, the strongest consensus we've ever had on this issue. And I think the Obama administration deserves some um, uh, credit for putting out some pretty strong statements and consistent statements on North Korean human rights <clears throat> over the past few years. So we've really hit, um, as hard as this issue is, uh, the strongest international and domestic consensus we've had on it. Um, but uh, for most of the time I've been working on North Korea, uh, the human rights issue has frequently been posed as a contradiction with diplomacy. Um, that uh, raising human rights was um, often uh, considered something that would undercut efforts to get progress on the nuclear issue with North Korea to establish confidence. <clears throat> and um, this has been true in every administration um, over the last 20 years or so, including, including the Bush administration. And as, and as you know, and Amanda knows, President Bush felt pretty strongly about this issue. <clears throat> um, I remember in the late 90s, for example, when I was at the Council on Foreign Relations, I was responsible for running uh, the North Korea task force at the Council, which included uh, about two dozen of the leading age experts in town to come up with a bipartisan consensus on North Korea policy. We didn't take it, and this is partly my fault, we didn't take a single look at this issue. It was all about the tactics and diplomacy of the nuclear issue and missiles and so forth. We didn't take a single look at this issue until um, KDO, um, brought in uh, some defectors to describe what life was like in the camps, and it was a moment that sort of shook everyone. And I remember arriving in the NSC in 2001 and receiving the draft human rights report from the Bureau of, um, of, of Democracy and uh, uh, DRL, mm -hmm. and there was no North Korea section. And I called and asked why, and they said, well, the previous uh, standing instructions from the seventh floor were to not, quote, unquote, name and blame North Korea as long as this sensitive diplomacy was going on about a possible presidential visit um, and so forth. <clears throat> um, and uh, the Japanese abductees um, were um, uh, largely um, ignored by the Japanese and US governments in the 90s. Um, and of course, in 2008, when you and I had already left the administration, um, sanctions were lifted on North Korea in spite of public promises this would not happen 
until there was progress on uh, determining the fate of the abductees from Japan, which is also, of course, a human rights issue. So we're in a place right now where the diplomacy with North Korea is largely frozen, um, where the administration talks about strategic patience, and, um, and where there is more room to um, be vocal about these issues. And I worry a little bit that if diplomacy gets back on track, there will be an instinct in some part of our government and other governments to start shelving this issue. <clears throat> and one thing to think about from that history is um, what would be the principles that the US government, the ROK government, um, Japan, Europe, would, uh, would follow to make sure there is consistent application of our national sources of leverage on this, as hard as they are. And we could talk about that uh, more, I suppose, in the conversation. But uh, as, as much as we've achieved, um, and as much as you hear in this conference, um, the default position for governments often is to view this issue as an inconvenience, frankly. And um, we need to think about how to make sure it stays on the front burner. All right, thanks. Um, uh, Chogapja, you have seen many of the issues that uh, Mike Green has talked about from the Korean perspective as a senior journalist. Uh, and you've also um, seen this issue develop over the years in South Korea. Could you give us your perspective? Uh, thank you. I think it is almost uh, two decades saying in English. So I must uh, request uh, your cooperation to understand my uh, English. Uh, last uh, 18th of December, 2014, was a great day for me uh, when I heard that news, UN Assembly passed a resolution on North Korean issue, human rights issues. It was the day of uh, dream come true for me. I belong to the first generation of reporters who began to have interest in North Korean human rights issues. Uh, in 1989, I first interviewed with uh, the famous or infamous the woman terrorist called Kim hyun who bombed uh, Korean airline 105, killing uh, 115. And I was shocked at his uh, testimony about uh, his, her life in North Korea because his testimony was almost the same with uh, what our government said. Uh, I was always suspicious of government uh, uh, information about North Korea. But what she said was uh, worse than government providing intelligence. So I uh, began to lead uh, North Korean escape. And uh, the North Korean escapee appeared in the scene of uh, South Korea in early 1990s when the Eastern Communist bloc collapsed. They brought truth and fact intelligence, information about uh, uh, North Korea. And uh, we uh, conveyed the information to Korean uh, public. And in 1992, Kang Chiran and An Hyo, uh, two persons who was in pre uh, the Yodok concentration camp, came over to Korea. So we began to focus on concentration camp. In 1994, there was a the man called An Myung Chul, who was guard, guard in concentration camp, who escaped. And he made a very detailed uh, description of his uh, role in concentration camp. And we, uh, at that time, I was a chief editor of Monthly Johnson. I translated it into English version, and it was uh, it became almost the full. So in 1995, early November, I went to Israel to make an interview with. Uh, Prime Minister Rabin, uh, he was also a defense minister. Uh, on afternoon of a Saturday, I went to his office in Tel Aviv, and uh, I made a one hour interview. At, at the end of the interview, I gave 
English version of a concentration camp testimony to, to him, urging Mr. Rabin uh, to pay attention to concentration camp because uh, you are Jews. Jews are uh, may understand what kind of uh, magnitude uh, concentration camp means. But Mr. Rabin get angry at me. He said, never compare to Holocaust. Holocaust is a unique thing. And uh, it is not comparable to anything. Anyhow, I left my pamphlet on his desk. And I returned via Frankfurt to uh, Gimpo Airport. I took taxi. Taxi driver told me Rabin was assassinated. Uh, I was the last, last reporter who interviewed Mr. Rabin. But 2003, David Hawke visited my office to investigate the concentration camp and wrote great report, the hidden uh, Gula. Uh, also, my magazine, Mantri Joseon, uh, made a very great scoop on the escape of uh, Ang Jang Yeo. We knew he will make uh, escape, uh, but we waited until he took the action, uh, not in Japan as planned, but in uh, China. I also witnessed the agony of uh, the late Wang Jiangya during a leftist administration that covered 10 years from uh, Kim Dae-jung and Nomin government, especially Kim Dae-jung government Kim Dae-jung government uh, put Hwang jang under surveillance, and uh, it took a kind of a covered operation to meet him. Uh, Hwang jang brought the information about the inner circle was, I think the most important information what Hwang jang brought is that in 1980s, uh, first half of in 1980s, that was Kim, Kim Il-sung's regime, but second half of 1980s were actually, that was Kim Jong-il's regime. And uh, <coughs> I still remember the joy which I felt on the 18th of uh, uh, December last year because that joy was doubled by our constitutional court verdict on uh, United Progressive Party. We call them Jongbuk, Jongbuk Jongdang. Jongbuk means North Korea follows, North Korea follows. And uh, our constitu constitutional court uh, abolished, dissolved that party on the grounds of they are pursuing the same goal with the North Korean Labor Party, uh, making South Korea a communist state, which will be eventually absorbed into North Korea. So two very important uh, legal documents uh, were appeared in, on the same day. International law uh, said that the North Korean regime committed uh, crimes against uh, humanity, crimes against humanity, and same magnitude as Hitler or uh, Stalin. Also, our constitutional law uh, made verdict on the North Korean followers 
uh, you are enemy of uh, freedom. We cannot allow freedom to the party who vows to destroy freedom itself. So two documents has some very important relationship. Uh, I want to summarize like that. Uh, by UN Assembly Resolution, North Korean regime became same kind of totalitarian regime like Hitler and Stalin. And in South Korea, there are very strong pro-North Korea faction. And also North Korean followers or host of promoter of North Korean <coughs> followers. They are they are like the people. Uh, I think it will be some radical comparison. Jews who are defending Hitler's Holocaust. Same North Korean followers who are defending and blocking, have been blocking the our nation, National Assembly passing the Human Rights Act almost for decades. Uh, I think the most underreported or ignored thing in Korean politics is the presence of very strong pro-North Korean influence. I want to explain about that phenomena because uh, they were successful to to make uh, to block uh, the have blocking the passing of uh, North Korean Human Rights Act. Also, they were successful blocking the sending balloon to North Korea. Also, they were successful blocking uh, Norwegian government joining PSI, but later Imengbak uh, joined the PSI. This means they are blocking mobilization of uh, national resource energy and the national will uh, to confront nuclear issue, nuclear threat, as well as human rights uh, issue. I want to explain the background of uh, this phenomenon. Uh, it all began with, uh, in 1980s, Gwangju uprising. Gwangju uprising was a kind of a crucial event in the shaping of uh, uh, student movement. And uh, North Korea used the Gwangju incident to influence uh, democratization movement. And the uh, movement was infiltrated by North Korean nationalism propaganda. And it focused to influence on South Korean public to sympathize the North as the weak and to the American as a kind of bully state. Uh, this student who experienced the leftist viewpoint during 1980s after graduating from colleges, they moved themselves into, into politics, media, academic, professor, law practicing, NGOs, and became assemblyman, journalist, teacher, professor, judge, and active, activist. Kim Dae-jung and Noh Moo-yeon regime uh, successively elected full support with uh, uh, these leftist uh, elements. And uh, I can calculate the structure of uh, public opinion in Korea now as uh, uh, three or four groups. 10% is, I think, 
pro North Korea, core, core pro North Korean element. 20% sympathize to pro North Korean element. And 30% uh, core conservative. And the remaining 40%, I will classify them as uh, uh, opportunist, opportunistic uh, middle. But the minority left is young, but the majority is uh, old and uh, disorganized. Why this kind of uh, thing happened? I think Korea has too much dependence on the United States for its uh, national security made Korean people irresponsible people. And uh, this also, this public opinion made also irresponsible politician, a kind of a vicious uh, circle. Uh, I want to make three interesting statistics. How the leftist rule or has, has a kind of hegemony in uh, Korean politics. Uh, the new politics alliance for democracy, the number one opposition party, uh, they have 130 members in uh, 300 members of the National Assembly. Among them, 21 members from new politics party have the record of being convicted of violating national security law and anti-communist law, which punishing mainly the pro-North Korean activities. Almost all of them were convicted after 1988, when, which means that they violated the law after democratically elected government began to respect the lawful procedure. And another uh, statistics is like this. Uh, during Norman's ad administration, 26 assemblymen criticized openly the passing of the North Korean Human Rights Act of 2004 in US Congress. All of them were ruling party members. Nine of them are serving as uh, assemblymen in opposition party now. Uh, according to a capture the uh, North Korean spy called Kim dong Sik, he said in 1990s, North Korean Operation Bureau instructed uh, North Korean followers in South Korea as follows. You can criticize North Korea if necessary, except for these five areas. You never, you never criticize these five, five points. One is North Korean leadership. Second, uh, leadership inheritance. Three, North Korean political system. Four, Kim Il-sung's self-reliance doctrine, so-called uh, to chase. Lastly, human rights atrocities. I think pro-North Korean faction uh, or uh, North Korean follows faction, they are follows this guideline uh, royally, even, even now. So uh, I made a little long. <laughs> I want to uh, stop here. But Thank you. I want to add that if I have a question. Sure, sure, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kim Tae Hyo, um, if, I wonder if you could also pick up on this issue of that uh, both um, Dr. Green and Chogap Jay raised about this the human rights and the nuclear issue. Um, you know, how did you have to deal with it in your administration? But particularly looking forward, you know, if you were still in the Blue House, how would you 
how would you deal with this? this momentum now on the human rights issue? Um, um, you know, depending on the, which way the wind blows, there's always a chance that uh, nuclear talks could restart again. I mean, how, how, would you, how would you bring those two things together, close that circle, or is there just a zero-sum trade-off there? Okay. Uh, to be included in the last session uh, is not a good thing normally because <laughs> <laughs> session after session, uh, normally you lose the number of the audiences. But today, it's very strange. Uh, most crowded and more important people in this last session, so I feel lucky today. And uh, I was impressed by uh, the uh, diversion of various uh, elements of the audiences, particularly because there are some lawmakers here and uh, administrators journalists, uh, international uh, organization staff, and uh, key people and NGO activists. So very diverse uh, membership uh, promises uh, in-depth and dynamic discussion. And uh, also I found diverse methodology here today. I learned a lot. There were some comparative case studies, and there were some narration approach, and there were some audio display and there were some interview approaches. So these mixture of all different methodologies make social science more mature and diverse. And also, I enjoyed interdisciplinary approach today. There were some uh, ethics and political science and the cognitive psychology and also international law. So these all approaches makes me uh, more exciting to approach the same human rights issues in terms of a policies and also a academic positions. Uh, let me be a more succinct in order to allow more a feed, feedback uh, questions and comments after all. And uh, first of all, I try to uh, just mention on three dimensions of North Korean human rights issues. First aspect is the threat to North Korean peoples freedom of their thoughts, and also threat to North Korean people's pursuing a better life in a new open society. The other dimension is the tens of thousands of North Korean core elite members. They are also victims because they are captured by Kim Jong-un's reign of terror. They say what they have to say, but they do not believe so. This is the problem. Third dimension is South Korean people. We are also victims because we have to pay higher political, military, economic, and psychological costs because of a divided peninsula and also these human rights condition. There are some uh, international challenges against the ROK government. First challenge is our coordination with the US government on balancing sticks and carrots towards the DPRK. If we reward Kim Jong-un regime, it will aggravate North Korean human rights condition. If we punish them, they'll try to send more laborers to international society, and also it will aggravate North Korean human rights condition. But good thing about this is that you reduces the power of the distribution system by the Kim Jong-un regime, and in consequences, you intended or not uh, markets and uh, more information and materials will be flourished in the black market in North Korean society, simply because of the weakened central control over the local society and their economy. Second challenge is a South Korea's separating security cooperation from history conflicts with Japan. South Korea and Japan is struggling for their bilateral relationship, and uh, as a result, we do not have a, a efficient and uh, dynamic trilateral security cooperation as we uh, did 10 or 15 years ago. So this is a huge challenge 
not only for Japan, but also Korean government. Third international challenge is handling the PRC's reluctance to encourage North Korean change while initiating discussions on a unified Korea. We have three free trade agreement with China, and the more and more we talk about future unified Korea relationship with China, but still China focuses more on peaceful and agreed unification rather than a South Korea initiated a peace and open a democratic society. So we still, a lot of challenges and tasks still left in terms of our a, engagement with China. The other point is our case domestic challenges. Professor and uh, uh, Honorable Cho gap already uh, explained the Korean domestic histories and our uh, dilemmas better than anyone else. And let me point out just the three domestic challenges. One challenge is ideological division, politicized uh, North Korean uh, policy already. We are divided between left and right and both sides are competing to buy more support from a, as you, Mr. Cho said, opportunistic, a critical mass or ignorant mass medias and a public masses. They do not have exact information. And sometimes when they witness summit meeting between North and South, they believe dialogue is better than anyone else, anything else. But some other government appears and try to uh, publicize that market is more, much more important and human rights issue is almost important. We have to limit our strategic assistance and then people start to get more other side of understanding about North Korea policy. So they are shaky. So key is uh, what is the central government position? Uh, what kind of network and power could be utilized by the president and its office staff members in order to uh, provide uh, accurate information and lead public to support their North Korea policy. The other one is as a result, Korean a vulnerable democracy into which North Korea has deeply penetrated. Already Mr. Cho mentioned. Third one is a, our preparation for unification particularly unification plan assimilating each field of North Korean society. Education, welfare policy, military, and economics, and jobs, trainings, everything. So regardless of any normal time, peacetime North Korea policy, we have to separately focus more on our own independent unification plan. My final point is about policy prescription we have to focus more on the present and immediate human rights violations in North Korea. As Michael Green already mentioned, diplomacy and engagement policy toward North Korea cannot be and should not be conflicted by our focus on humanitarian concerns. It's a problem of balancing and you can wisely uh, uphold and pursue these two things depending upon your strategy. My second point is to ensure that ROK-US policy toward North Korea is consistent and well coordinated. In particular, essential military and political measures that can be adopted without negotiation with North Korean leaders should be our top priority. We don't have enough time to wait out until North Korean leaders' mind change. So, for now, what we can do and what we should do is to find out more creative and effective solutions that can change North Korean local societies, that can change North Korean elites, that can change North Korean people's minds through our own independent creative measures. So alliance and like-minded countries, active and uh, proactive approaches can still make meaningful tangible result without strong agreement from North Korean leaders. My final point is about strengthening strategic dialogue with the Chinese government on the issues of North Korean refugees and limiting flows of strategic materials to North Korea and possible cooperation during and after North Korean contingencies. Thank you. 
right. Thanks, Dale. Uh, John Sifton, um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what are the challenges that you see going forward for the NGO community now that momentum, momentum has built over 2014. And as we look to the future, what sort of things do you see NGOs having to do to try to move government policy in the directions that you'd like to see? Well, first of all, I'll say I share Michael Green's anxiety about the trade-off that will happen if diplomacy is revived in a meaningful sense. Uh, I don't think we should kid ourselves. We need to be very honest that if there was a well-coordinated effort of outreach by the North Korean government to the international community on the nuclear proliferation issue or just on general issues, uh, proliferation and human rights, it would immediately impact the capacity to keep the human rights issue on the table at the Security Council. Simply their extension of a invitation to the Special Rapporteur cost us huge amounts of anxiety and heart heartache as we lobbied in the Security Council for votes on the General, excuse me, in the General Assembly on, the, on votes for the General Assembly resolution as many fence-sitting countries said, well, they've, they've, invited, they've invited the Special Rapporteur. Should we perhaps consider easing up on the language? And uh, you know, we had to say, no, don't, don't let up. It would be a terrible bargain to trade off uh, a single Special Rapporteur visit for operative language in a historic General Assembly resolution. We have to keep the ball rolling. And thankfully, uh, it didn't go forward, in part due to DPRK's own um, lack of honesty in extending that offer. But I, I raise all that because I share your anxiety. I really think this is uh, a concern down the line. We can balance, we can try to balance, we should try to balance, I think that's correct. But at the end of the day, diplomacy's gain will be the human rights movement's loss. We will suffer uh, as we try to push this forward. But you know, you asked before, one of the earlier panelists, what could be done to mitigate that or, or offset that problem. And there are a couple of ideas. I mean, one is if you create institutions and processes, whether in the United Nations context or any other, which can't be traded away in diplomacy very easily, then they can't be traded away in diplomacy very easily. So if you create a sole office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is actively investigating and carrying out research, and you set it, you wind it up, as it were, to go, and it's funded, and it can't be easily or procedurally unwound and stopped, then it can't be traded away in the diplomatic realm. And that's good, because it should keep doing its work. Uh, if, you, if, you have, if you have certain things going on in the context of the other special procedures, excuse me, that's inside UN talk, that, the special procedures of the UN Human Rights Council, the special rapporteurs, the working groups, if they are actively pursuing efforts which are, are paying um, dividends, you know, you've created a process that is moving along that can't be traded away because the non-proliferation diplomats, whether they're from the ROK or Japan or Russia or the United States, can't just turn off the UN system. The UN system is its own thing, and it can't be controlled by the National Security Council or, or the ROK government. So that's one solution. The other is um, just in the domestic law of the ROK in the United States, you know, passing the legislative regimes which create new sanctions, uh, listings for the Treasury Department here in Washington to restrict financial relationships with individuals in North Korea, banks in China, which do business with them. If you, if you start these things going, it's not as though um, they can be unwound so easily if diplomacy revives. I'm not against diplomacy. I'm not saying, you know, I'm, try, I'm not trying to sabotage diplomacy. But I think there are some hedges that can be taken so that negotiators can't simply trade away legitimate and meaningful and important human rights efforts. Uh, it's, it's, the lessons of Burma, you know, again, rear the, the, their head here. Um, the sanctions regime played a huge role in convincing the military junta in Burma to turn away. And uh, the sanctions in Burma, in Human Rights Watch's view, were lifted 
were relaxed a little bit too quickly and the leverage was lost a little bit too quickly. It's the sense that you, you will trade things away if, if North Korea uh, engages in real legitimate diplomacy down the line, but let's try to keep it to a minimum and not relax those sanctions too well. I think it's right not to make too much of a big deal about the politicization, politicization issue. I mean, it's, it's definitely true that in the ROK, the, the domestic situation has been, towards North Korea's human rights situation, has been highly politicized. But let's, let's remember that it's become less so, and that in Japan it is much less so, and that here in Washington it is very much not so. Um, it is not politicized. You know, President Bush met abductees from Japan and other victims. President Obama met abductees when he went to Tokyo last year. Um, we have Senators Rubio, Senators like Barbara Boxer, different people very interested in the North Korea situation. Representative Royce, Representative Engel, you know, co-sponsoring efforts on legislation in the House. Um, this isn't about communism. It's not about free markets. It's not about Republican or Democratic ideologies. It's about human rights. And that's an important thing to remember as we go forward. Okay. Great. That was my way of answering the question. Great, John. Those are a great set of comments, and particularly this point about how policymakers have to really internalize that what's happening here and what's been happening with the COI over the past year are truly meaningful things. They're not simply, uh, you know, they're not sort of things that just happen because there's nothing else happening with North Korea that they really do have meaning for, um, for everybody. Um, we do have some time uh, for questions. I know the audience has been very patient. Um, if you, uh, I think we have people with mics uh, roaming around. If you could uh, ask your question, we'll go here, jong -an. Kim. Hi, my name is Jong Han Kim. I'm an attorney. I have a question for Michael Green. Uh, it appears that the United States is a, an important party, perhaps the most important party in this issue on North Korean human rights. How do we keep this issue alive and get the traction going with the current administration, with the U.S. administration, or even if in the next U.S. administration? And not, when the diplomacy comes back, you had mentioned there's a tension, and not, so we don't make sure that this issue doesn't get pushed aside. So I, with consciousness raising, I would hope that, um, that in our presidential cycle this comes up and candidates are asked about it. <clears throat> and I would hope their answer would be that um, engagement and diplomacy have a purpose, but there are two areas where um, the United States will not um, compromise for the sake of dialogue. And one would be illicit and illegal activities by North Korea, which violate international law and which are a threat. Um, and the second would be uh, human rights violations. And just set that out as a principle. Um, I, I like very much what John said about ways to institutionalize this. Um, I think the um, reporting requirements within legislatures, the US Congress, the National Assembly, the Japanese Diet, annual regular reporting requirements, in the 90s, it was very, uh, there was a great debate in the Clinton administration about whether or not to talk about the PLA military buildup until Congress required an annual military report on the PLA. So it became a matter of course for the Pentagon to report on what the uh, PLA was doing. <clears throat> um, and it led to a, you know, an unemotional, pragmatic discussion of what that meant for US policy. So a regular reporting requirement uh, within, the, within the legislatures would help. <clears throat> um, I think there are specific issues that should be targeted. One would be what's called in diplomacy, refoulement, which is returning forcibly refugees, which China is guilty of. And I would like to see in the US ROK 2 plus 2 and other statements a strategy for convincing countries, China principally, um, to not violate international norms with respect to forced repatriation. And to come up with this as a joint position of the US ROK and, and one would hope other democracies vis-a-vis -vis Be Beijing, but one that's highlighted early. I think a number of these things will help keep this at the forefront. We're not in the same place as we were in the 90s because I think there's so much skepticism now about what diplomacy will yield with North Korea. Yeah. They've cheated on so many agreements 
on nuclear issues and missile issues that the, the currency of negotiations is, is, is reduced somewhat. So that might make it a little bit easier. And the last thing I'd say is um, I always felt in the White House it was, you know, we, the first um, uh, pa passage uh, of a resolution against North Korea was in around 2003, right? And, but it was a very near run thing and the governments of Kim Dae-jung and No Mu Hyun were very hesitant um, to move on this. They were one of the last movers. Um, and as a result, it was very hard for the US or other countries to get the Europeans to act with one voice. There were very different opinions within Europe. <clears throat> um, and so the, the real Achilles heel of the international effort to focus on this is what uh, Tejo and Mr. Cho pointed to, the polarization within, within the ROK. That's really the Achilles heel. And passage of a North Korean Human Rights Act would help. But um, you know, I was listening to Mr. Cho describe these um, former prisoners and people who'd been arrested and street protesters, and I was thinking, yeah, these were victors and my counterparts in the Blue House when we were in the NSC, and we, we worked pretty well together. Um, and I think that ultimately there's going to have to be a dialogue across ideological lines in the ROK. It can't just be imposed from the right, even though most of the energy is on the right. It has to be a dialogue to try to find middle ground, uh, to close that, the, the biggest Achilles heel. Uh, yes, Andrew Yeo. Hi, Andrew Yeo, Catholic University. My question is for our two uh, distinguished panelists from South Korea. I was wondering if you could give us an update on uh, the North Korean Human Rights Act uh, in South Korea and what your thoughts are on a uh, path forward in, in getting this legislation through. Thank you. <laughs> As Governor Kim Munsu already mentioned during his luncheon speech, more than 15 Korean local governments is urging a Korean parliament to speed up the process of North Korean Human Rights Act. And in this coming April, Seoul is a plan to host the North Korean Human Rights a Field Attaché Office in Seoul. So that will be, I think, a, another a, a positive momentum for Korean people to remember and, uh, and uh, to assure the importance of this issue. So I think not only the ruling party, but also the opposition and mass media and all the Korean people need to be continuously uh, get a ring for the importance of uh, this matter. And then they should be a self a a compare a, what is the international audiences and uh, what the other outside members are doing on the same issue and uh, how much they have been a, so reactive so far. That kind of a, a comparison uh, will be uh, tested, I think, in this coming spring. Do you want to say anything on this? Would you like to say anything about the North Korean Human Rights Act? Okay. Next question. Yes. Um, my name is Grace Kang. Um, what do you think of the idea of harnessing the momentum created by the COI to seek the downgrading of the legitimacy of DPRK at the UN by rejecting the credentials of DPRK so that it cannot participate in the activities of the UN General Assembly. This would be akin to what happened to South Africa. Um, what do you think of that? John, do you want to take crack at that? <laughs> That's a great law school exam question. <laughs> um, I think there, no, there, there would be, lo there would be uh, losses, costs to doing that. Um, there would be a pretty minor benefit in terms of isolation. Um, but I don't think that the benefits outweigh the costs. There is some talk, by the way, about the International Criminal Court jurisdiction of the Republic of Korea being interpreted as the whole of the peninsula, which would give the ICC jurisdiction over North Korea, which might be made possible by such a move. But um, I, I, I don't think the, the benefits outweigh the costs. 
It, it's one of those strange ideas which has been floated, like the trillion dollar coin to pay off the national debt. Uh, that I think, you know, it's interesting to think about, but perhaps not the best policy idea. But, but others may feel differently. Uh, Carl, Carl? The costs are you would lose the dialogues. I mean, they are at Geneva. They are talking to, um, they are brought before the Human Rights Commission. They engage. Uh, they're at, there are fora in which you can engage with them, which Ambassador King has engaged with them and others. And, um, that's, those are areas in which, you know, when there will be improvements, when there will be progress made, that'll be where it happens. So you'd be losing all that if you kicked them out of the UN. Okay, thanks. Uh, Carl Gershman. Uh, Mr. Kim spoke about tens of thousands of elites in North Korea that are victims. Uh, I wonder if you could um, speak a little bit more about that, um, uh, how to reach those people, um, and are they the source of potential cleavage within the North Korean system? I think very few royal uh, Kim family members are a extreme cases because they cannot change their mind and uh, they cannot uh, change their existing position even during and after unification. But those members are less than 100 people. So except for these a few number of people, I think almost tens of thousands of North Korean elite members can be uh, mobilized or transformed into pro-South Korean people after unification. Like German cases, you have to prepare for your own a, a alternative solutions, finding jobs and the retraining themselves and give them a more a field experiences in military area and factories and some more a expertise a, a fields and areas. But at this moment, a many a progressive people in South Korea are arguing that a hawkish policy toward North Korea has not produced any uh, good consequences. See Pyongyang, more buildings and the lively streets and North Korean economies, you cannot find any famines as before. But uh, these are missing some important facts. North Korean peoples are not starving because of their own uh, autonomous markets, not because of central government distribution system. As Lee Myung-Hwa government and current government are limiting strategic aid to North Korea, including rice, cash, and oils, North Korea should extract more of cashes using other illegal ways, and then North Korean society and people and elite groups are corrupted, and they are uh, finding their own uh, independent new patterns of lives. This one is accumulating a much more a mutual discrepancies and mutual suspicions, even among core elite groups. So if something happens, and if their internal debate deepens against some their policy failures, uh, you can see some surprising consequences. These uh, phenomena are accumulating now, but from the surface, you can say that Kim Jong-un is safely control everything, and you cannot see any problems from the core elite groups, and North Korean streets and Pyongyang seems to be okay. But I, th I see and I sense that more danger and uh, a uncertainties of internal Pyongyang and North Korean society. Ambassador Lee, you want to say something on this? Yeah, sort of a two-finger. <laughs> the forum is not really <laughs> There's a mic behind you. No. Yeah, on, I think it's a very important question that, that you raised. I just wanted to make one very quick point, and this is probably the reason why we have to transition from the, especially as the international community, particularly the United Nations. I don't know whether we'll take the ICC route or you know, the, the international tribunal route, but as we think about and prepare for the criminal prosecutory mechanism, 
it's very important to transition from the collective responsibility to more individualized sort of crime, uh, criminal act, or guilt, uh, which basically means that we have to look at individuals and, and start naming these people uh, who are directly responsible. I think that's a very important foundation for any prosecutory uh, mechanism. So I think that, in part, sort of addresses the issue that you, that you raised. I just wanted to raise that. Okay, thanks. Um, and I think we have one last question from uh, uh, Nick. So Nick back there, Nick Eberstadt. Thank you, Victor. Uh, Nick Eberstadt, American Enterprise Institute. I've got a question for my friends, uh, Kim Tehyo and Cho Gapche, about the politics, or maybe we should call it the psychopathology of uh, North Korean human rights in South Korea. It's very, very hard for South Korea's foreign friends to understand the tremendously deep ambivalence that so much of the South Korean population has about promoting human rights in the DPRK. Uh, the nearest analogy for American society or for European societies was the intellectual disorder that was known as anti-anti-communism uh, back in the old days. And anti-anti-communism really didn't end until the collapse of the Soviet Union. My clinical question is, um, do you see practical ways in which people on the progressive side of the aisle can be welcomed in and included in the North Korean human rights movement in South Korea? And if so, what needs to be done to include them? Uh, I think uh, in Korean Peninsula, the most important thing is ideology. I think ideology is the most important strategy, also policy. And we are fighting with the communists. Communist, they are communist. Of course, someone uh, calls the North Korea not communist, but they are communist plus a kind of a cult, or uh, you can say gangster family. Anyhow, uh, but this kind of thing not happened in South Korea only. Uh, we can say in 1930s in Europe. There was many intellectuals who defended the Stalin's mass execution and the short trial. And this kind of uh, uh, defending uh, Stalinism uh, transferred uh, to their country, their country, uh, because the intellectual wrote many uh, books, articles, and it became a kind of a moral decay among the European intellectual society. I think similar thing happened in 1930s in United States. United States. Uh, after the depression, the intellectuals turned to left, and many bright men from East joined the uh, Communist Party and became spy. Uh, I remember two famous person, L.J. His <laughs> and uh, Dexter to White. So the UN and the IMF uh, planned by two Soviet uh, spies. Almost the same thing happened in South Korea in during 1980s. And, uh, the genuine, uh, genius propaganda from North Korea. They disguised <coughs> as nationalist, not communist. And you said progressive. But actually, in Korea, there is no progress. Uh, the pro North Korean faction in Korea is uh, called progressive. But they are not progress, they are ultra uh, reactionary. And some, some 
English uh, newspaper in Korea even calls, even called the United Progressive Party, which dissolved by a, a constraint called liberal. How you can say the, the pro-North Korean uh, faction liberal? They are blocking the passing of uh, Human Rights Act in the uh, National Assembly, but they are called in South Korean media as a liberal, progressive, uh, democratic fighters, etc. So I think uh, it explains some uh, situation in South Korea, but it is not only thing in the world. Some <laughs> happens in another country, in another age. Thanks, Teho. Did you want to say something on this? I'd like to find an answer uh, on next question from power politics in both North and South Korea. Most uh, North Korea experts uh, make mistakes simply by looking at North Korea from the lenses of some just radical communism. This is not a simple communist country. This is a very unique Kim family dynasty uh, leadership country. So Russia and China, they are collective leadership. So newcomers come and try to deny the former leaders. And then they should focus more on daily lives of the people to uh, gather more public support to sustain their power. But North Korea, grandfather, father, and grandson, they are all from the same family. They do not have any flexibility to look at human rights issues or other things. They just absorb into their own family power. That's the a nonsense dilemma of North Korean human rights situation. South Korea too. Opposition party try to do their own best to win the next presidential election. And 2000, there was a first South North Summit meeting People got surprised and they get emotionalized. And then they voted for another next president, no. And then 2007, less explosive, but people still pour into tears. And many people became to believe in 10 years that dialogue is best. And then they do not have enough information on North Korean nuclear threat. They do not have enough understanding on human rights situations. So, Human rights situation now in South Korean politics is a little bit boring than just simple dialogue with North Korean leaders. So it takes time. You have to change the perception of the people, and then you have to find out a new way of winning the next election. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, um, so I'm, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time for this panel, so I want to thank our panelists very much for a very stimulating discussion on policy issues. Um, so it's uh, my job just to adjourn the session. Let me start by thanking everybody. So I want to, and I have the list, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Kirby and Commissioner DeRuzman and Commissioner Berserko for joining us today, Ambassador King, Ambassador Lee, uh, Kirk Campbell, who was with us this morning, uh, Carl Gershman and Governor Kim Wun Su for your speeches at lunchtime. I want to thank my co-organizers, Amanda Schnetzer, uh, Lindsay Lloyd from the Bush Institute, um, as well as Greg uh, from HRNK, uh, and Lee Jong-hun and uh, Liz from uh, the Yonsei Center for Human Liberty. Um, and I also want to thank all of our staff. Uh, I feel that we need to do this since they all were working late into the night yesterday to make this happen. Marie, Dumond, Ellen Kim, Rosa Park, SJ, everybody. Uh, Liz, thank you very much for all of your help. Um, let me just say in closing that um, I'll never forget in the, the time I was at the White House, one conversation I had with a North Korean defector, and uh, Mike was there for this as well, who we brought in to see uh, the president. And afterwards, as we were walking out and leaving, um, he looked back at the White House compound and he pointed to the West Wing and he said, is this the White House? And we said, no, that's the West Wing. The big building is the White House. That's where the president and Mrs. Bush and everyone live. And he just looked at us and he said, thank you. And I said, 
thank you for, do you want a tour? Is that what you want? He said, no, just thank you because if you didn't care, meeting all of us here, then nobody would care. Um, and I think as the, your video said, I mean, why do we all work so hard on this issue? It's because we care. And I feel like today was something very special. I mean, we had all the elements against us. We had the snow. We had uh, late arriving food. We had uh, protests from the DPRK in New York. And in spite of all this, all of you are still here at the end of a very long day. Uh, and I think it's just testament to the fact that we're celebrating the commission's work, uh, but there's still a lot more to do. And I think we're all here because that's what we're going to do. We're not done yet. There's a lot more to do. So thank you all very much. And this